Well, we'll see who joins us. Uh, a couple minutes yet. Mm -hmm. Did you get a chance to read much of that chapter? Uh -huh. You bogged me down very quickly. <laughs> okay. I read it while and then skimmed the while and then looked at the footnotes. I did it, not. I did ahead. not, Alan. I'm sorry. That's all right. She was, uh, it was, she tried a, a different tack on this one. Um, speaking more about how there was a huge distinction between state government and elected officials, et cetera, et cetera, and how the, the typical soldier was viewed and, and actually the role that the soldier had in that day and culture, so. I can't figure out what, why, she, why, you know, what drove her to write this book that would be well, such a good explanation, but it just hadn't ever been done before, I guess. Well, she wrote the book, well, in the very beginning of the book, she explains how she started and what, what prompted her to write this book in, okay, in, 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 the, in the introduction. All right. And uh, it was to, uh, she's a, she is an expert and um, a professor of the antiquities. And so she knows a lot about the culture and the day and time in which all this stuff was written. And what those, a lot of those words actually meant something different uh, when you factor in the way people lived, how they viewed the world and people in the world in that day and time. Right. So it, it changes everything from the way we understand it to the way uh, people understood yeah. it back in the first century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I saw Jamie. There she is. Yeah. You're muted. You can't, we can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> Can't hear you. Speak up. <laughs> uh oh. No. <laughs> There, there you go. There, there you me. go. <laughs> she had the line, the red line through her mute thing too, but I don't know why it was showing it to us, not her. Yeah. Well, <laughs> mine didn't. Uh, I had to make it show. Right. That right, was the problem. Right. Oh yes. Did I tell you that I decided this book is more explanation than inspiration? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. But you know what's what's so what I found interesting about it is, it it really uh, upends a lot of our preconceptions about what Paul meant when what he was talking to and how he was really providing uh, a whole new system of equality that didn't exist in that day and time. <clears throat> no wonder he was in jail. Yeah, he took several beatings, too. <laughs> Paul did. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he talks about it a couple of times being beat, uh, given 39 lashes, 40 was considered, uh, would consider almost uh, capital, deadly. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah. Yeah, once you try to stay, start changing the status quo, uh, speaking against powers to be, why? Well, not, even, not even speaking against, but speaking in a way that threatens their own existence. No. You know, you don't have to denigrate them, but if you speak about it, I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. never, uh, never came out and demonized the, the people that he was working to bring equality, uh, working to see them bring equality for his own, his own black people. He just, he just used them, 
you know, it's like the, the march on the Pettus Bridge. He says, all we got to do is march and they'll expose themselves for who they really are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we don't need to say anything, you know. But in that day and age, the very idea of mixing races was uh, so palpable that they didn't need to say anything. Their very presence shouted. That's it. Yeah. So when these guys showed up with their clubs and their whips and their tear gas and everything else like that, just to disperse a peaceful march. Yeah. And their dogs. Yep. So this chapter I thought was pretty interesting for me because I did some more research online about it. But I read what she had to say and she, uh, th this one is uh, just following orders from the state. Just keeping the line. I'm sorry? Just keeping the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end. So what struck you in this? What? Well, mostly at the end where it said keeping the line was a matter of life and death, not only for your colleagues, but if you didn't keep the line, it was a matter of life and death for you because they'd kill you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I underline, I have marked that. Um, yeah, that it was and some of the words she used, the Greek, the Greek language in that day and time uh, wasn't so much, it wasn't subservience, it was about duty and uh, the things we talk about today, duty and honor, doing the right thing for the person to your left and to your right. And the, the uh, soldiers come back and say, we weren't fighting for country, we were fighting for our buddy next to us. Exactly. That's, that, that, that kind of thing, yeah. So, uh, but what's interesting to me is I didn't realize too, is that it was the soldiers in the community that really helped that held the community together, not so much the elected officials. Was that because the people were afraid of them or they feared that they should obey them? No, they had infinitely more respect for them. All right. Uh, because of the codes at which they lived and trained under, you mm -hmm. know, duty, honor, integrity, valor, and it was towards each each person. And the other aspect that she she note I noticed that she wrote about it was just that everybody joined the military. Practically everybody did. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, Jews by law were forbidden, and they were forbidden to join the military, but. Uh, joining joining the military and learning uh, the practices and discipline of the military gained you some social status that you may not have had before you joined. And it would make you a Roman citizen. And we and we see some of that playing out today in our uh, when we find out about various soldiers that have joined the United States forces and uh, they may have been uh, here on a visa or they may have been illegal, uh, however they got in. But once they've joined the military and served for X number of years, um, there were cases where people wanted to, they found out that they were here illegally, they were gonna deport them back to Mexico after serving in the military. And that raised such a stink that uh, a lot of that was prevented because they had served tours of duty in Iraq or Afghanistan. So it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of a carryover, you know, in the Western culture, that, um, that regard, that high regard we give to people who have served in the military and, um, and, and, and maybe gone out to, to do various campaigns. Now, I have something I was going to uh, give to you. If you got a pencil and paper, um, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about this, uh, chapter 13, the first part of chapter 13. 
in Romans. Um, yeah. And, and you can look it up and read it or, and hear it for yourself. Um, the, the first one I found was a, was a sermon. And what I didn't write down was who it was. But um, it's either a Roman, either Roman Catholic or Episcopal. Could have been Lutheran. But if you go to ROOD, screen, S-C-R-E-E-N, dot org. Is there a space between the D and the G? No. Oh, no. one word. Okay. Yeah. Rodscreen.org. And the title is uh, Why We as Christians Cannot Ignore the Misuse of Romans 13. Mm -hmm. Hey. Hey. Hey, Cuddy. I have Cuddy right here. Cuddy's in. <laughs> But why we uh, Christians cannot misuse. No, why, why we as Christians cannot ignore the misuse of Romans 13. Oh. Um, and uh, I don't know if you remember, um, way back in the very beginning years of uh, the Trump administration, uh, the Attorney General at the time, Jeff Sessions, gave a speech about the whole uh, program where they were separating children from their parents at the border. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he used that Romans 13 as an excuse for doing so. Mm -hmm. and, not and, and for people not to complain about it. That the authorities, I mean, he actually quoted from Romans, and he, he used that as a pretext to justify, or, or dragging God into it to justify what they were doing. Um, so that is probably the most recent uh, historical case we have of overtly misusing that, that text. Well, if the government says it's right, uh, then it is right because God ordained that government. God sanctioned it. It's Romans 13's what? Romans 13, I think it's the first uh, one through seven. Okay, thanks. Um, and... Um, a lot of people used it, especially in Germany, uh, prior to the Holocaust even, uh, for the election and the establishment of uh, the Nazi regime. People, it was taught from the churches uh, all throughout Eastern Europe and all throughout uh, Germany that God ordained this. So that person's in power because God put him there. So that's God's elect. And we still have people proclaiming that no matter what party you're a member of <laughs> today. Well, I did some study on QAnon and uh, Trump yeah. is, as I suspected, a Christ figure. Right. Uh, and it doesn't matter what he says or well, they were a little disappointed when he wasn't inaugurated a second time, but uh, they just changed the message, but he's their leader, and uh, it's very dangerous. For, for anybody. I mean, it doesn't matter who this person is, um, but, um, you know, just because, a law, just because a law has been passed doesn't make it moral. Legality does not necessarily equal morality. I mean, just look at all the Jim Crow laws that we know about in the South. Yeah, look about, think, think about 
what Nazi Germany did. They passing these various laws doesn't make them moral. It doesn't make them just. It doesn't make them God ordained. So this, this Romans, this, this Romans 13 that she's talking about, you know, about following orders and stuff like that is been horribly misused um, all throughout, all throughout history. Well, don't people feel that we're on a path, a plan, and that's just part of it. When you get someone nominated and they end up causing problems, all that is just leading you to one place. A lot of people feel like that. Yeah. Is that Lutheran predestination? Uh, now, Lutherans don't have that. That's a I don't know. I never heard anything like that. That's more of a, that's more along the lines of some Presbyterian thinking. Presbyterian, okay. Yeah, but, uh, but even that's not monolithic, not, not you know, it's. Uh, well, the idea that we were predestined to do whatever we were to do and to suck it up. Uh, well, if, if, if things like Jim Crow and the Holocaust and the Crusades were predestined, uh, then I think that makes God complicit. And you'd have to decide now, is that the God you want to worship? Well, I have decided that, uh, let's say the Jim Crow laws, that the way we were living as a white society really did sort of, um, make it very probable that we would end up in a clash. Oh yeah, I mean. When people just figured out that uh, we were all God's children and none of us five, three fifths. Right, right, well, all right. So, I mean, I just got through reading some of, um, some history. I'm getting ready to go to the, the Washita battlefield Monday uh, mm. because I got to go to Sayre to get a vaccine, my second vaccine. Oh. <laughs> And the Washita battlefield, I've always wanted to go, never had time. I'd always drive by it. But now I have time, so I'm going to go by and look at that. But there's a classic example, another example of, you know, uh, this notion of manifest destiny, that we are God-ordained to take over this continent, and, and these savages just must, must be eradicated. Right. You know, so there's another example of... Um, uh, I guess, I guess you could call it a form of genocide. Of course, back in that day and time, that word didn't even exist, but yeah, it was mass extinction. Alan? Yes. Uh, just a little note. I did a, a tour out on Route 66 and I saw that battlefield <clears throat> on, at the time when our government was shut down uh, so we didn't get to go in the the monument. I mean, the, you know, the historical park that was there. Uh, we got a, a a local person who was an a, an Indian. Um, I can't remember what tribe, who came and talked to us. And the story is so fascinating and so heartbreaking. It is. That they laid claim to all that in Colorado and so on in God's name. That's right. Well, it was a um, uh, Lieutenant or Colonel Covington, who was a Methodist minister who initiated in Colorado the massacre at Sand Creek. Yeah. He and and the militia. one there at Washita followed that. That's right. That's exactly right. That and was, I had never, I had never heard of that before. Yeah, well, I heard about it uh, by reading history and reading about what uh, Custer had done. That was yeah. Custer's expedition that did that seventh cavalry. Right. 
Um, but that whole mentality back then uh, boiled out of manifest destiny, the teaching of manifest destiny. You know, this is God, <laughs> you know, and so I, it's, it's just, just, I have come up with what I call Christian, um, uh, Christian superiority, Christian entitlement. I looked up how many Christians in the world, 31%. Of the 31%, 50% are Roman Catholic. We are trying to bend the whip to the whole world for our own personal spiritual beliefs. Yep, that happens, that happens. But to us more than others. Well, uh, the, <laughs> the Buddhists fight amongst one another and they've even had their wars. They've had their massacres where the Buddhists wage war on other Buddhists. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those human conditions, I think, you know, that the mind can run off the, and, and justify uh, atrocities and abuse and cruelty, and they use it as a rationale. They use their faith and their religion as a rationale to do that instead of the teachings. <laughs> And the Bible says so. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, find, it, go ahead. But you can find it in there somewhere. You could oh. it, but just like this, used to justify it. There are several things. Treating women, the, the, you know, the, the whole thing. Uh, if you dig far enough, you can find something that says what you wanted to say. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, it's not immune to, I mean, it's not immune to any Christian faith. It's not immune to any uh, Muslim faith. It's not immune to any Hindu. I mean, the Hindus and Muslims have been fighting one another and killing one another for years. Their Buddhists and Hindus have been fighting one another and killing one another for years. I mean, we've been doing this. And um, yeah, we use our faith to justify actions of cruelty and abuse. Yeah. We'll because we're right and they're wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but this, this chapter to me was um, uh, interesting in that another thing I learned is that um, Paul was writing to the, uh, the non-Jewish Christians in Rome and helping, trying to give them guidance and, and, and ways to welcome back into Rome the Jewish Christians. Because they have been expelled. The Jews have been expelled. They've been expelled a number of times in Rome. <clears throat> As they were in, in uh, Spain in uh, 1492, the big pogrom there that you either become Jewish or you have to leave the country. Yeah. Or become Christian or leave the country. So. <clears throat> so that's what Paul's trying to help uh, the go on. Uh, help those two communities welcome one another and be hospitable to one another, take care of one another. But it was interesting that she said, like she, she was talking about in Tarsus, um, you know, because she knows that area and studied the antiquities of that area, was a very, uh, very large commercial center uh, but it was a very peaceful town. And primarily not because of the elected officials, the government, but because of the soldiers. The soldiers' discipline and keeping order spilled over into the streets of keeping discipline and order. And so they mainly found themselves uh, not, a, not an allegiance to the state or to any government, but to their commanding officer. which I found is when I was thinking about this, when I was reading all of this, I was thinking also that about the movie, The Gladiator. They did the same thing in that movie. The way they portrayed it historically is they were, they were, uh, the soldiers were loyal to um, 
Maximus, the commander of the Army of the North, not to the emperor and not to the Senate, not to the government of Rome. They were loyal to their commander. Interesting, interesting. And then in our day and time, you're loyal to the government. You swear an oath to protect the constitution, not the commander, not the president, you know, to protect the constitution. I, I noticed the contrast uh, uh, in the co concept of war. Uh, now in the U US, I think most people think that war is uh, evil, even though we go to war because we, we want to protect our nation uh, or we want to have a military for that. But um, in the Roman times, uh, they didn't think about war being immoral or moral. It was just always there. Uh, there were always wars. Right. And uh, I think there was a comment made that by the author that uh, maybe some of them thought they should be fighting uh, the barbarians rather than their own people, but it was not that war itself was immoral. Right. And she talks about that too. It, it, like you said, she talks about the difference between the wars that were on the borders of Rome and the civil wars that were going on in Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they, when the civil wars got put down for the most part, then they had a kind of peace that came about through the soldiers and the commanders of the armies. But the, the other wars that were being fought on a, on a large scale uh, were always on the edges and the borders of the Roman Empire. But Paul is right into the very center of the Roman Empire. And the cities, those port cities around the Mediterranean that Rome pretty much had uh, control of. Yeah. There's a great book um, by Chris Hedges uh, called uh, War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning. Um, very enlightening book. Um, Uh, he was a war correspondent for years. He graduated from the Harvard Divinity School and then thought maybe he's called more into, uh, uh, into the world and not so much a sacramental life. And he became a war correspondent for a number of years for several different newspapers and he would write for. And so he writes out of his experiences as a war correspondent and working with uh, soldiers and civilians on the ground in those various areas, war-torn areas that he was in. Um, and it's, it's just an amazing read. It really, it really is. Um, Would you repeat his last name? Hedges, like a hedge on hedgerow. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, and yet war is a force that gives us meaning. Um, one of the things that I found so interesting in his book, and I've read it in others as well, especially books I've read about on post-traumatic stress, um, is that so many uh, young men that join the military, especially during times of war, with the notion of going over there and really saving our country and preventing evil from exploding within our borders and stuff like that. Once they get there, they realize this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I expected. This, I had no idea that mm -hmm. the carnage I'm seeing and experiencing is of any good to anybody. And a great many of them have issues as, as they are having today. Uh, we're still we're still around the neighborhood of uh, 18 to 22 suicides veterans a day um, because this noble idea vanishes in all in a heartbeat once you're actually involved in a situation and um, the um, 
Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. He was uh, an Army Ranger, served in combat, and later taught psychology at West Point. Now he's an adjunct professor at um, University of Arkansas. He's written several books. Um, the first one of his I read was on was, was entitled "On War." Um, no, it was called "On." Um, yeah, and uh, he talks about the human. The human is very, very much loath to take another body, uh, take another life. It doesn't really like doing that. Uh, except for some people, of course. There are some people who are psychopaths. Um, but the vast majority of people, 90% of people, do not in any way, shape, or form enjoy taking uh, uh, another life, no matter what the circumstances are. They could be 100% justified, if you will, in protecting themselves or somebody that's weaker than them, you know, from, from deadly harm. But once that happens, the psychological impact of that is enormous absolutely enormous and um, he talks about um, how the governments have been able to turn that around in the past uh, probably 50 60 years and make people much more willing to kill but they have left them with the psychological scars that can't be undone and um, so it, it's it, it's a pretty amazing read. Um, but then he wrote another book, which I thought was, um, no, his first book was On Killing. No, I'm sorry, it was called On Killing. The second book was called On Combat. And in that book, he talks about uh, warriors, what, the, what he terms warriors. Um, he says a warrior, his definition of a warrior is a person who goes in when everybody's running out. And that can be firemen, it can be EMTs, it can be you know, doctors without borders, it can be uh, police officers, it could be anybody who is willing to go into a, a tragic situation, a human tra uh, tragedy of some kind, when everybody else wants to get, uh, get away from it. And um, he talks about the need for that, that we need people like that. Like 9-11. Yeah, he said those were warriors. And, um, I, and then he said that he goes into the deeper meaning of warriors as understood uh, from a lot of indigenous cultures, like Native American cultures, for instance. Uh, and the true meaning of a warrior uh, is one that is to protect the weak and the infirmed those who cannot take care of themselves. It's not to go out and <laughs> wage war. I mean, that, that may be something that happens, but the primary purpose is to take care of the weak and the infirmed. That's what a warrior does. And every class... I'm what, sorry. Was that author, what was that author's name? This is a different author from Chris That's, Hedges. Yes, this is Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N. Thank you. M-A-N. M-A-N, yes. Yeah. Interesting. It is, it is, and it, uh, so it's not, it's, it's not an either or situation, but the primary purpose, he says, of a warrior is to protect those who cannot protect themselves, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And so that could be, that, I mean, that can work into uh, the issue of civil rights that can that, that can work into all kinds of things, not simply uh, warfare. Hmm. He um, 
he taught that the prophets in the Old Testament were warriors. They went and spoke truth to power and they spoke truth to power. They went in when nobody else would go in. They spoke truth to power for the weak and those who couldn't defend themselves and those who the system was running over and trampling over and abusing or marginalizing. There's a film that I've rented a couple times called Luther, and it's the story of Martin Luther. And it's a wonderful film, very, very good one. And it shows the very, very poor Catholic people who are expected to bring their alms to the church, and they're starving, and they're old, and they're beaten down and they're crawling up the steps of the church with their coin in their hand because it's expected of them. And I guess the church back then ran the towns. They were just oh. over everything and over all the people. Yes. It's very interesting. It's a good movie. It's really interesting. Um, you tour a lot of this, a lot of the towns in uh, Italy. When when I was over there, and I, I mean, I was only there for like uh, what eight days, but everywhere we went, little town, whatever, there was there was something that always stood out. In the middle of every town, there was a church with a spire. That was the center of the town. That's and I and as a matter of fact, that's where you would find a lot of it. That was the center of the city. So it had a very high prominence, very high prominence. Yeah, Luther had his demons too, though. <laughs> he was very anti. He was very anti-Semitic. Very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff that Hitler used to justify his rounding up of the Jews and putting them in camps, labor camps. Uh, he actually pulled out of Luther's own writings. Luther proposed that. Mm. That their property be taken away and they be given, put in a, a central area to live. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's, we're a mixture, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We do good and we do bad. Yeah, well, that's the way we are, you know. The other thing I'll throw at you uh, that I was looking at, a number of people, uh, uh, authorities said, remember to always take, you have to take it in its entire context, the, 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 uh, the Book of Romans. Um, remember, you know, 13 comes right after chapter 12. So you read chapter 12 and then you go into uh, chapter 13. So you, you can't just say oh, it's oh this or it's that. It's both of them all together. And even chapter 13 where it goes on, um, he talks about um, owe nobody anything. And that was a big deal. That was a big deal to be in debt, mm -hmm. as she talked about in, in, the, in the book. Uh, people would just mock you and make fun of you. So you didn't want to be in debt to anybody. It was the cultural standard of the time. And so he was just reinforcing some of that. The only thing to be in debt to is to love the other person. So. <clears throat> and then lastly, I have read from different scholars have said, but there's, there's no assurance on it. There's, there's, there's absolutely, uh, there's not a hundred percent assurance that this first part of Paul's chapter 13, one through seven, some people say it was inserted later on. 
in translation that it was put into his letter later on. And some people are saying that they believe that um, it was done so after um, uh, Rome declared Christianity to be a state religion. Mm. But there, not everybody agrees on that. Mm. So it's a conjecture that people make, uh, some scholars have made because the flow of the writing doesn't, doesn't seem to sink in with some of his other, other writings. It seems to be all of a sudden this thing is stuck in the middle of the, uh, or stuck towards the end of the chapter of Romans. And when you read before and after it, it doesn't quite fit. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to, it's like he, like a subject was just dumped there. And um, once Christianity became a, a, a religion of the state, then it was, uh, we need to put this in there. <laughs> uh, keep people um, submissive to the government, if you will. So that's another, there's, there's another possibility in this. But I think more importantly, what I found from her chapter was uh, how people have misused this to justify uh, obeying unjust laws. And then for our next chapter, we'll do chapter six. <clears throat> and that's going to be, that's a pretty good one, um, especially because we can refer uh, to one of Paul's letters. Uh, Philemon, the, law, the letter he wrote to Philemon. That's... That's really instructive. Oh, Alan? Yes. Uh, is there any uh, talk about doing a book during Lent? Yes. Uh, I've, got, I've got a book that uh, Mother Mary Ann recommended. It looks really good, too. Um, I've got a copy of it. I've only started examining it. It's, it's a book by Rowan Williams looking at various saints throughout our Christian tradition. Hmm. And not only that, but there, some of them aren't even on our, our Christian tradition. Uh, one of them in particular, um, Ellie um, Hellisman, she was a, she was a Jew in... Um, I'm trying to think, was it Norway? Uh, when the Nazis uh, came in. And uh, her book, the title of her book is, is called An, An Interrupted Life. And um, by Ellie Hellesman. And uh, just a fascinating book. But he uses her as one of the people that, um, not a saint of the church, but what she did and how she dealt with the oppression of the Nazis. And then there's uh, lots of other ones. There's, uh, you know, going all the way back from early Christianity up through, you know, uh, Julian in Norwich is there. Um, St. Augustine is there. I mean, there's other, there's other people in there and it's just little, little snippet stories about them. Sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah. What's the name of 
Roland Williams book? Uh, I don't have it with me. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll email it out. Okay. I'll email it out. We'll pick which one you think is the best one and we'll do it. Okay. Well, you know, we're only going to have so many of them to just even look at. So, but mm -hmm. um, is anybody familiar with Ellie Hellisman? Ever heard the name before? No, I haven't. Okay. Really fascinating woman. Really, really uh, just an amazing woman. Um, How do you spell her name, Alan? Uh, e L L Y. Um, and her last name is H E L L S M A N. I believe that's right. I think I've heard the title of that book. Yeah, it's A Life Interrupted is what it's called. Um, But a, a lot of the a lot of it, the uh, the the book in the very beginning of the book, the, maybe the first two thirds of her book is just about her personal life, and living under the Nazi regime and what she, how she tried to just move around and get around and help other people who the Nazis were looking for, and some of her own personal struggles with, um, um, romance. Uh, affairs uh, that she was having with one man in particular and just I mean but you you, you really get a sense of her life she's, she's she's no angel but by the same token there was something in her that she could not allow uh, what was going on and then when she tried to work around it she got stuck in the middle of it but she wouldn't leave it she wouldn't abandon hope in God and, 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 the, and the sense of presence of God's love in her life and in the life of everyone she was working with. And she was working in these camps that they held the Jews before they exported them to be exterminated. So. Sounds like something Hollywood should get a hold of and oh, do a job yeah. of it. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know why they haven't. I mean, that's, she's, she was a pretty amazing story, I thought. Well, that way more people know about it. Yeah, get yeah. The movie of it. Yeah, I mean, she she was uh, like a uh, a minister of God's love in those in those horrible camp conditions, uh, and just you know, I mean, she suffered some setbacks herself, but she'd always spring back. She and she talks about it. It's kind of like her. It's kind of like her autobiography and some of her diary. I mean, she wrote this. A life interrupted. Well, how did she remain free? I'm sorry? How did she remain free? She didn't. Well, she didn't. No, she died. The but her book, her book got out. The manuscript got out. Okay. What was the name of the priest or a Lutheran minister, maybe? Presbyterian who wrote against his, his Hitler during the war. Bonhoeffer. Thank you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I think he's, he's mentioned in that book as well that we're going to be looking at. He left Germany and went to uh, and taught at uh, one of the seminaries in New York City. I, didn't, I can't remember if it was Union or General. Uh, but things got so bad in Germany that he went back. Somebody had to stand up to this guy. And then Bonhoeffer was implicated in the assassination, one of the assassination attempts. There were many assassination attempts on Hitler, but he was implicated, I guess, uh, in that one uh, towards the end of the, Hold on. the end, the end of the third Reich. And um, he was, uh, executed by the Germans, by the Nazis. So. He almost anyway. made it to the end of the war though, didn't he? I'm sorry? Yeah. He well, almost. Just, just about the end of the war. It was in 45. Yeah. I think it was April of 45. Uh, and the war ended in May. Um, but uh, it's quite a tragedy. Um, so anyway, 
he uh, that's what we have for our class today. Um, anything? Have any, anybody have any comments about um, any, before we go about what they read or questions? Well, it led me to a meditation on the value of creativity and to stepping out of line versus the need for uh, an army or a civilization or a culture to stay in line for the good of the culture. I reached no conclusions. Yeah, that's a pretty prophetic thing to have to do. <laughs> Oh, I guess I decided we need both, but how does the the individual decide which <clears throat> camp she is supposed to be in? <clears throat> That's always a good question. I also would, um, if anybody wants me to send it to them, I'm, I have posted it on Facebook, and and uh, there was a letter to letter opinion letter written to the Sepulpa newspaper that was published um, and com and he, she said she started writing it right after the election and she compares uh, the tragedy and maybe compares is the wrong word but the danger of um, uh, well, the danger of our, the, the number of people who are becoming, I'm sorry, my brain is not working well after my surgery, uh, um, yeah. of the Oklahoma City bombing ah. and, and the, the nature of the terrorism that is happening in, in our country and, you know, but for 9-11, it's all internal. And um, when, I pub when I posted that, a lovely friend of mine who is a devout Christian chose to post something in favor of Trump um, and call me out on posting it. it it's just beyond belief to me. Um, but I decided to post it because I know here in Oklahoma, we all remember exactly where we were when we heard about that bombing. That was close to home. And what one person could do, or two, however, you know, what, it, it, was, it wasn't much uh, to cause carnage that, um, it's taken, and I had a friend that was in the building and happened to have gone to the restroom instead of going to the meeting she was supposed to go to because she was a few minutes late. Mm. Uh, she would have been in one of the front rooms. Um, so if anybody would like, or you, I'm sure you can Google the Sepulpa newspaper and, um, and read it. it, it's very well done. Do you know what the date was that it was uh, written? Um, let me see if I, I should be able to pull it up here on my phone. Just a second. It's called um, Never Forget the Lessons of Oklahoma City, Election Misinformation and the danger of far right wing extremism. January 20th. Thank you. It was written by Jody Allen, A-L-L-E-N. <clears throat> well, all right. So next week, we'll just go to the next chapter. And, yeah. and that is in time.
That is chapter. Uh, that is chapter six. You said. Uh, let's see. I think that. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's on slavery. About slavery. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody here but us bondsmen. All on slavery. And um, if you want to uh, work with that a little bit more, read the the book of uh, Philemon. P-H-I-L-M-O-N. That was Paul's letter to a slave owner. And if you want to get a deeper understanding of how Paul felt about it. Ah, okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan, once again. Thank you. See y'all at... Okay. <laughs> Remember the meeting at 1130. We need a quorum. Oh, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. Yeah. So yeah, if uh, please show up at the 11:30 meeting so we can have a quorum to do the business of the church. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bye. Have a good week. Yes.